I'm going to skip forward to, to the role that you've just ended. You've just finished your tenure as the president of the Royal Society, which yep. is a, a pretty august uh, uh, lineage to have been part of. Give us just an idea of what that actually means. The Royal Society is the oldest scientific body in the world. What does running it mean? Well, the Royal Society is the oldest and probably the most distinguished science academy. There's only uh, the, the US National Academy is, uh, is often considered in the same place, but um, it played a very important role in actually inventing modern science in the 1660s. It's indeed august, so I mean, we, we had people in the 17th century like Newton and um, Samuel Pepys and Christopher Wren were all um, presidents. Um, nearly every president in the 20th century and now the 21st century has been a Nobel laureate. And it's the only academy in the world where academic distinction is the mo major um, criterion. Mostly it becomes more those who get involved in policy and administration, but here it is academic distinction. And it is essentially um, the major unofficial advisor about science to government. The government has its own civil service support, but the Royal Society provides informal um, a, a, a advice to government, and they are unlikely to do anything uh, to do with science without consulting the president and the society. And I've just carried out a review of all um, science, for example, uh, government-funded science in the UK, um, as part of that um, um, idea. But do they come to you, or do you have to push the agenda from the scientist's perspective? In, in the case of this review, which was, uh, which was promoted largely by George Osborne, um, they came to me. Um, we have a very good relationship. If I write to the Prime Minister as President of the Royal Society, I will always get a reply. Always get a reply. So we can promote the agenda, um, and they also ask us. It works both ways. Dear Dave, we need more money. <laughs> Lots of love, Dear, Paul. No, no, no. Dear Prime Minister, I know you fully support science, and I know that you think it is central to the future of the United Kingdom. I think we should talk about exactly what support is now applied to it, something like that. So right. in turn, but there you go. So that's, that really leads on to what I, what I want to ask about what the role means as a politician. So you now move away, although as you say, the Royal Society is a scientific body that is primarily concerned with, with top level research. But at the, at the point where you are president and you are ahead of this body, you then have to interact with the people who, for whom top-level research isn't necessarily their prime concern. And then you have to temper your language. And do you find yourself making concessions or saying things that you might not necessarily say to me in private, or to, well, not me, because I'm a journalist, or to your colleagues at the Crick? Or, you know, what, what, how does that change your view on how you communicate? Do you know, it doesn't. What, I have more respect for politicians than most of my colleagues. They are usually very intelligent, and they will usually listen. Not all, I accept that, but many will. Those who are responsible for the science quite often see it as something that they're really committed to. For example, David Willits and David Sainsbury would be two examples of individuals who loved it. I mean, neither of them were scientists, but they were very, very um, supportive. The approach I've taken is actually to be very, to respect them, but be very straightforward. So I don't say, you know, invest another 2% and we will cure cancer. I think it's, it's naive nonsense to say that. You tell it how it is, that we are the greatest science nation in the world over hundreds of years, that science plays a critical role for the future of humankind and for democracy, actually, as our political decisions become increasingly technocratic. It needs to be supported. We need to release the creativity of scientists in the UK, and then we will get the knowledge that we can use to drive our economy, improve the quality of our lives, improve our health, protect the environment. It will work. And if you don't <coughs> promise that immediately you'll solve something, they will get that and they will support it. And I'm, I think we have to be honest and straightforward with our political masters. In the last five years, there have been two effective comprehensive spending reviews, one five years ago and one that's just been settled in the last uh, month, I think. Correct. 
um, and both presumably you were heavily involved with those conversations directly with the Chancellor's office. Absolutely, so I was involved in both of those and if you, you, you probably know we came out well on both occasions. Yes. Not spectacularly well yes. in the sense that we didn't get massive growth but we were protected last time this time we are protected and grow with inflation. We've done much better than most sectors. Do you, so I know some of the responsibility falls to you for that and some of the credit, but there was, a, there was a broader sort of motivation by the scientific community. And I can never quite work out whether that was effective in the sense that there were some grassroots scientists saying to, you know, campaigning. Scientists are not very good at campaigning. Um, Where does the conversation actually take place? I can't really say, but what I will tell you is, for example, in the last um, four months before that spending review, I saw the Chancellor three times, and on one occasion for one hour on a one-to-one -one meeting. And I don't think that the Chancellor will do that unless they are committed to science. So I actually think that we've won that battle, um, and the issue is really the balancing with all the needs that the politicians have to deal with, um, which has... Uh, which we have to, of course, deal with, but they recognise the important role, in my view, that science has to play. And do, do, you have a, <laughs> do you have a steer on Joe Johnson at this point? Well, Joe, I've also, who's the, our present science minister, the brother of Boris, actually, though they are rather different sorts of characters. Um, and Joe, I think, is warming to the job. I do. I am, of course, uh, as you've realised, an unbridled optimist and idealist. Well, that's interesting because I want to... So that's the relationship with government, and I haven't probed particularly deeply. If it was on the radio programme, I'd probably give you a harder time than this, and then my editors would cut it out. Um, but there's this other role that you have as the president of the Royal Society, but also as a Nobel Prize winner, and in, in many ways, the most senior scientist in this country for the last 10 years. Five years. 10 years. I'm saying 10, since, 2000, since, since the Nobel Prize. Since the Nobel Prize. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so there's this, the talk, talking to government is one half of it, but then there's also the, the public face that you're talking to the press and you're yeah. talking to the public and you've been very uh, forthcoming in coming forward and you've presented TV programmes. Um, one, one of our interactions, which I always enjoy, is once a year there is the, the Royal Society hosts a party for real scientists to meet pretend scientists like me, or people in the media. And for the last five years, you've stood up and in introducing that, that, that party. And you've done headlines, the worst headlines of the year. So where the press have failed. It's Terribly. True. I got a little test for you. Oh, right. So I asked Twitter for the worst scientific headlines of the last couple of years. And the game is, I'll, I'll give you, I don't know, five or six. Let's see how we go. I want you to going. He's going to embarrass me. Well, I want you to identify which ones are real and which ones were made up by me. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so the first one is, and I won't say which newspapers they come from, but they're not, some of them are obvious, but they're not all, they're, they're across the, the spectrum. Bananas as good as drugs for treating drugs, scientists say. Adam. Nope, that was from the Daily Mail. <laughs> um, Studies show young, unsupervised children most at risk for dog bites. Um, <laughs> that that is really that comes. Science? Uh, yes. yes, it was. Yes. Yes. Okay, that's real. <laughs> yes, it was. You know, that comes from the school of uh, the, the University of the Bleeding Obvious, really, doesn't it? Here's another one. Overweight children have different eating patterns than normal children. <laughs> yes, that's Adam. Yep. No, that was real as well. <laughs> um, a gene that predicts what time of day you will die. That couldn't be you. That was the Atlantic, very august, <laughs> very august. Really? I mean, I can keep going on. There's, there's another, there's a fun game. Headlines to which the answer is, is no, right? So I'd just say no. Are vegetarians to blame for climate change? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> can the sun cure cancer? I think they mean the one in the sky. Uh, yes, in part. We'll come back to that. <laughs> Does Jasper, the seven-year-old rescue... Rather avoiding the sun can, in part. No, that wasn't what the story was about. Yes, I'm sure. Does Jasper, the seven-year-old rescue dog, have the cure for cancer? <laughs> oh, I'm sure, yes. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I've spoiled this really because they're all they're all real. I haven't made up you know, any of them. This is true. I have to say, this science meets the media. What I would do is gather all the most ghastly headlines and make fun of the journalists for. Uh, 15 minutes. All of whom are in the audience. In the audience. I loved it. It should be safe. Here's the absolute, but this isn't even a headline. This, was the, this is the, the full length of the story. Malaria could be beaten as boffins find the protein that makes the disease grow at Nottingham University. Now, it just struck me that that was a really good example of failed punctuation there. I say that's to do with grammar, I think. <laughs> yes. yes. Anyway, the serious, the serious, the underlying point to this is yes. that you stand up and say, you know, God, we make a, a, an ass of ourselves sometimes in the press by misrepresenting science so appallingly. How, how bad is it? All right. Well, I actually think um, uh, is that science journalists like you do a pretty good job in this country, in fact, a very good job. The problem you've got is the headline writers and the editors to get it in there who want something which is a bit sexier. So in my experience, most science journalists are OK, but it gets twisted around to make it sound better, gets a headline on top of it which barely reflects what's under it. And it's such a pity because fundamentally you're doing a decent job. Well, thank you for saying that. It's very kind of you. I, I do feel that that things have got better as in the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years. I feel like we've, we've improved and these are, I picked these out as, it was harder to find these now than it than was 10 say years five ago. Years ago. Yeah. I also think it's better. I also think uh, um, the mass media, TV, particularly the BBC, is taking a great deal of interest in science. It has um, Brian Cox as a, as a star presenter. What I think is that, actually, I, I do want to say this, when we have a good scientist presenter, we should nurture them. And there are some brilliant ones. I mean, David Attenborough would not count himself as a scientist, but he, he, he did zoology and, of course, is, is, is a complete national treasure. Brian Cox is excellent at it. The problem I have a bit is that my colleagues often uh, sort of snipe at them a bit, you know, because they, you know, they're good looking, they're good on the camera and they, they sort of don't seem to like it. We should cherish them. They do a wonderful job for us. Thank you for saying that. That's I didn't say you, actually. I was saying um, <laughs> presenters. No, yeah. I, I, was, I was reading, reading between the lines. 